Good morning again, everybody. Welcome to our November alumni career paths focused on careers in regulatory and clinical affairs. My name is Michael Matron. I'm the Associate Director of the Office of Career and Professional Development. And today I'm joined by two of our distinguished alumni, um, Brandy Saunders and Patrick Heiser, who will be talking to you about their career path since they've left um, UCSF. Um, so a little bit about them. Um, Brandy is a nursing program alumna from 2004, and Patrick is a, um, a biomedical sciences program alumna, sorry, there's a typo there, in 2007. Um, and if you wish, one of the one purpose of this program is to help connect you with those who have careers that you um, might want to pursue. And so we provided their contact information on how they wish to be contacted. We will drop this in the chat after I'm done sharing, um, just so you have access to it there. Um, and so I look forward to hearing from um, Brandy and Patrick about their careers and how, and, and the advice that they'll give to all of you about how they got there. Um, so a bit about this program, if this is your first time joining us for an alumni career paths um, program, it's a collaboration amongst multiple units at UCSF. Um, I'm in the Office of Career and Professional Development, but there are but it's a collaboration between the uh, registered campus organization called Black Excellence in STEM, um, which, 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 is, which aims to um, mentor and highlight um, the careers um, for Black scientists and um, scientists of color. Um, it's also a collaboration with um, the Alumni Relations Office. Um, and this, you know, this idea all started from a graduate student-led um, alumni career series that um, went on monthly prior to COVID. And so with COVID, it paused. And so we took this as an opportunity to revive it and to put some um, further infrastructure around it to make sure that this would be something that could last um, throughout time and not, um, you know, not only in the past. So why do we bring these programs to you? Um, in this case, it's really that all career paths, not just for PhDs, but all that all career paths for students who are here at, um, at UCSF are successful ones. Um, there's still the stigma in academia that the career that you've been trained to do, whether that be as a nurse or as a, an MD or um, as a PhD scientist that you know, following that um, strict linear career path is the only one that's successful, but we want to um, highlight that that is not the case and all are successful because there's many things that you can do with your career. We also want to highlight um, that and, and, enforce, and highlight that representation matters. We want um, to bring people who have similar experiences and, and similar identities to use so that you can see that people who share those identities and experiences do great things with their careers and so can you. And like I said earlier, this program is, in, is another purpose is to help you connect with those who have careers that you might want to pursue because there's always a little bit of anxiety with reaching out to somebody you don't know. And we hope that putting some faces and names together can um, help you identify someone who's willing to help you get to where you want to go. Um, this isn't just a standalone program that we do once and forget about. It is recorded today, but it also is um, complemented by a, a resource that we call the fundamentals. It's six common questions that we ask all of our panelists about their careers. And it's a um, it lives on the OCPD website, and you can find it through this QR code or the tiny URL that I've included here. Um, and so if um, you were watching this video um, after the live event, you can access this through our website and learn about these career paths from those who do it um, every day. And so I also will drop this tiny URL link into our chat once we are done with introductions. Um, and so... Just an overview of how this event will go today. We'll go through some introductions. We'll, um, we're gonna have Katie Maloney from the alumni office share what is UCSF Connect if you haven't heard of it and how you can use it to connect with others who have been here at, at UCSF and learn about the careers that they've taken. We'll jump from there into a moderated Q&A. Um, that will be the recorded portion. We'll turn off the recording and we'll open it up to those of you who are in attendance today to ask the questions that are important to you. And we'll just have some closing remarks um, before we wrap up for today. So with that, I will also 
you know, say thank you to all these wonderful people who have made this program possible. I was saying to Brandy and Patrick earlier that it takes a village to make things like this happening from inviting speakers to running the show to recording it and, you know, and um, taking attendance to those who come. And so I can, it wouldn't be possible with all of these people who are involved currently and formerly as well. So thank you to all who are in, um, who have helped make this possible. So with that, I will stop share and I will turn the virtual microphone over to Katie to talk a little bit to you about um, UCSF Connect if it's a resource you don't know about. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Mike. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Katie. I work in the alumni office and I'm also one of the admins of UCSF Connect. This is our um, virtual uh, networking community for all of UCSF Connect. Um, alumni, current students, postdocs, uh, residents, fellows, faculty, staff are all welcome to join. And everyone who joins, we have confirmed our UCSF uh, community. I'm going to share my screen and show you inside UCSF Connect so you can uh, take a peek to see how it works. It's very easy to register and join. You can um, use your email and create a password. You can use your LinkedIn um, login and password. You can use your My Access login and password and, and, and get yourself in. If you use LinkedIn, you can also sync your LinkedIn profile and then you don't have to create a brand new profile from scratch. I highly recommend you do that or make sure that when you create your profile, you create some a robust profile with information about where you've gone to school, what different job and work experience you've had. So people can find you and ask you questions about your careers, but we use this as a way to find and identify alumni to serve on these panels. Um, and, uh, and it's just a really great resource. If you see on the screen here, you can see um, the feed where people post different updates and information, um, articles, uh, jobs, um, uh, events coming up. Um, if you have an event, you could um, post it here um, and add it um, for the UCSF community. I want to show you the groups. We have an alumni careers career paths group that you are very welcome to join. This includes all of our past speakers uh, in the last year or so and the team that is working um, on the career paths programming and every month series. And so you can use the directory to find um, our um, past speakers and connect with them. Um, but you also can use the larger directory. Uh, and I'm just clicking over here to our main directory. You can see we have almost uh, 4,700 users in UCSF Connect. Um, all of them have opted in to join this community. Uh, and, and so I think that that really is a nice uh, way to kind of indicate that they're here and willing to help and connect with you. Um, if I was looking for alumni who are in regulatory or clinical affairs, uh, since it's not a major uh, um, at our field of study at UCSF, I'd probably go into the keyword search here and um, type in regulatory if I knew how to spell it. And it um, br brought us down to 73 users. Uh, then what I'd probably do is click up people who are alums and postdoc alums. Uh, that gets us down to 55. I could then go, um, how are they willing to help? How about answer questions, um, an answer um, specific questions about my field? Gets us 44, still a pretty big list. You may then want to um, narrow it down by your school or by your field of study uh, to see if there's anyone who has a similar background to you. You could also narrow it down by say special affinity. Perhaps there's someone here in this group who's also first gen um, to college. And if you are too, that might be a good way to narrow it down. Um, but then what I'd recommend is to just go through this list of 44 and, and take a peek. How did they use that word regulatory in their, in their um, profile? And it may not be in the way that you're looking for. Uh, and so maybe they're not the right fit. But I think within here, if you looked around, you could do some different searching. Um, another interesting thing to do in this field is I know the FDA is something that's important um, in regulatory affairs many times. Who has the words FDA in their profile? Here we have 10 alumni who are willing to help. 
um, who do. And so it may or may not be the right fit, but I'd, I'd encourage you, there's not, you don't do one perfect search. You probably wanna do five or six different searches, look around, see which um, alumni um, would be good to connect with. And then what I would recommend um, is that when you go into someone's profile, and uh, let me uh, let me clear things out here and pull up my own. If I was the person you'd want to connect with and you're very willing to um, um, please email message me within the community if you'd like to do a test message just to see how it works, but it's as easy as clicking this here. You can write a, a message as you would, uh, you know, to request an informational interview. If you'd like to attach your resume, you can do that. Um, hit send, and that would go to my inbox, and I would find it and be able to reply to you. You could also uh, click the request help here um, and write a message, and again, send it and would go to me. Um, and so I'd encourage you to use that to message um, other, uh, to any alumni or anyone who's in the community. Um, and use that as a way to, to reach out. Um, and I know that um, both of our speakers today are in UCSF Connect. We really appreciate that they're willing to join and use this as a way that um, others can find and connect with them. Um, and I'm here for any questions at the end of the program. Thank you so much, Katie. Uh, it really is a fantastic tool, um, one to help you to explore careers, but also to find the community that you want to join or, that, or might want to join um, because we've, we feel that that is important to a successful to group career is to be with a community of like-minded individuals. So we hope that you'll use it and if um, you'll be willing to connect with others on it. So with that, we're gonna jump into our moderated Q&A and Jasmine King, who's uh, our, um, a student ambassador in OCPD, but and also a member of BSTEM will be co-moderating with me. Um, so you'll hear us both asking questions. But our first one, we'll start with Brandy and I have um, Patrick answer our second. But the question is, or the prompt rather, is to tell us your career story um, from when you were here at UCSF to how you got to your current role. So and focusing on things like where you studied and what you studied and how um, your training and your path has led to the current position that you have today. Sure. So hi, everybody. My name is Brandi Saunders. I am a proud UCSF alumna from the class of 2004 um, in the School of Nursing at that. So I um, did not do a PhD program. I did do um, an MS, Master of Science program at UC um, and excited to be here and uh, would love to stay connected with in, uh, any and all of you as, as you um, would like as well. I uh, had initially been looking around and trying to figure out exactly what graduate program I wanted to look into. And I actually was working at the NIH. I lived here in the Washington DC area where I live now and um, had sought um, out some, I would say top tier um, I, I definitely think UCSF is a top tier graduate school. So I'm very selective. I was selective about where I wanted to, um, to uh, attend graduate school. So I uh, looked at uh, UCSF. I also looked at uh, Columbia and um, I had been working at NIH as a nurse, um, uh, funny enough on the same floor with Dr. Fauci. So we used to do rounds with him regularly and who knew he was gonna become who he has become for us um, <laughs> over the last two years. Um, but I knew that working on, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar, but that NIH is a um, the National Institutes of Health and it is um, not a traditional clinical setting. So basically all patients coming through NIH are within the clinical research. They're on clinical research protocols, they're treated based off of clinical research protocols, et cetera. And so when I was looking around, I saw that UCSF really stood out for me because there was a graduate program through the School of Nursing that was titled Clinical Research Management. And so for me, it was kind of a no brainer. I applied for the program. Um, in the meantime, took a travel nursing assignment out to, Cal to, to, to Los Angeles so I could hang out in LA and, um, and, and ultimately ended up uh, starting school fall of 2002 at UC and was also working as a nurse uh, at the medical center. So I was in school full-time and I was also working part-time. And uh, basically that was, that was how I landed at UCSF. And 
um, when I graduated, or not even when I graduated, as I was there, you know, there are a lot of different um, areas within the School of Nursing that you can focus on. Again, I was within the clinical research space, but I kind of already knew that I wanted to go down the path of the pharmaceutical industry. Um, I had an interest there, um, but I was probably an N of one um, when I think about some of the folks in, in the program. Um, but I did have some very supportive professors, two in particular, who said, hey, I know some folks over at Genentech, uh, Vaxgen, or some other small companies in the biotech space um, uh, out there in San Francisco. So I kind of focused on that. And that was that was always an interest for me. And I, I you know, again, didn't, after working bedside for many years, I just I said, this is what I want to pursue. So um, I took um, uh, my graduate degree and went out back to LA and ended up at Amgen. And, um, you know, didn't know about Amgen. I knew it was in Thousand Oaks, California. And I'm like, where is that? I, I'm in LA. You know, that sounds far. And uh, a friend of mine was uh, an HR person at, at Baxter. And she just said, you should definitely look at, look at an opportunity. So looked at the opportunity, jumped into uh, the biotech industry via Amgen as um, one of many nurses and doctors that were hired um, in their pharmacovigilance um, department. And so that's a very common um, entryway for folks who have, you know, nursing backgrounds or, or medical backgrounds to, to come through pharmacovigilance or what they call drug safety. And then from there moved into regulatory affairs um, and also into um, uh, what is the other? Oh, office, the Office of Ethics and Compliance. And so was there for about seven years. And, you know, what was nice was you can move around, you know, if you find a company you like, I always suggest, you know, you know, if you're interested and you see something else of interest, jump into it. And I did that. And then ultimately came back East and was um, working at Bausch & Long. And, and then from the, and then back in regulatory. So again, I started in safety, went into regulatory, did compliance, back to regulatory, and was um, uh, really excited about Welsh and Lom, but was extremely bored uh, working and talking about eyeballs all day. And so <laughs> I just said, I got to find something else. Um, it was very, uh, you know, day to day was very similar. I kind of knew exactly what time lunch was going to be. I was like, this is not an environment I'm used to, um, but great people and a lot of good work. And then I decided to go over to Forest Pharma and Forest was very focused on CNS, which is central nervous system, um, the C central nervous system therapeutic area. And they were looking at treating patients with bipolar, who had major depressive disorder, et cetera. So that was a new therapeutic area for me. Um, to go then over to um, uh, to Abby, um, and Abby has been a really had been a really good opportunity for me to expand my background in regulatory affairs to now understand global. Um, regulatory affairs. And so the one thing I haven't actually specified is under regulatory, there are multiple arms. And the area that I chose to focus on, which has been really exciting and fun, has is called with the um, advertising and promotion. And so within regulatory affairs, there's there's writing, regulatory writing, there's reg strategy, there's regulatory ad promo, which is advertising promotion. And that's what I've been focused on for the past 17 years. And um, there's some other areas. And so um, I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second, but from there, um, as I mentioned, I went over to Abby and really started to learn how you promote prescription drugs in other countries and, and um, spent seven years there before landing at Opus Regulatory, which I have now been um, working at for the last four months. So I'm new to consulting, but basically took my skill set and decided to throw myself into this um, very unpredictable space of working with clients that, you know, I don't know where they are in their journey of, of developing products, but <laughs> I find out and I just jump in and work with them. Um, so yeah, so I don't want to talk too much longer. I'm happy to expand more about what I do on a day-to-day -day if you, if you want um, in another, during another part of the call. Thank you so much, Grandy. I certainly learned something new because I didn't know that that exists. Like those two different, those branches existed of regulatory affairs. So thank you for that. Patrick, same prompt, you know, tell us your story from when you were at UCSF to where you are now, focusing on what you studied and how your training led to where you are today. Uh, happy to do so. Um, first of all, I, I just want to say how nice it is to see the UCSF logo in the corner of my screen. Um, I think I owe a lot to the university. I did, uh, I did two internships as a college student during the summer at UCSF, and they really were pivotal in convincing me that I wanted to pursue a career in science. Um, during one of those internships, I met my future wife, 
Um, so, so I would program that as well. And so it was no brainer that when I finished my college degree that I really wanted to pursue a career in, in, in biomedical research. Um, the questions in science that most excite me are the ones that are most applicable to, to patient care, to, to improving you know, outcomes and, and safety for patients. And so I, I was very fortunate to have uh, done a PhD within the biomedical science program in the laboratory of Matthias Hebrock within the Diabetes Center. And, and it gave me not, not just a, a fantastic foundation in how to conduct well-controlled science, but I also got a chance to see Matthias, who it was in his first few years as a, as a junior faculty member, um, establish himself within, within his academic career. And, and what I saw both excited me as well as terrified me in terms of what that looked like. Um, and heading out of the, the PhD and, and into my postdoc, which I did at, at Harvard University, I, I was kind of on the fence as to where I thought I'd be most, um, most at home. I, I knew that the questions I worked at that, that were translational in nature while in the diabetes center were the ones that I found most exciting. And I deliberately chose a lab at Harvard that was working on translational medicine where they were doing drug screens to identify things that could directly go into the clinic to help with neurodegenerative disease. And I figured that was the right bridge to make me um, evaluate whether a career in industry or academia was, was the best choice. So as I got towards the end of my postdoc and began to think about setting up academic interviews, I also began to explore options within an industry. And if any of you have already started doing this, you'll quickly realize that absent programs like the, the one we're at right now, there really aren't a whole lot of resources explaining how one makes the jump from, from academia to, to, to pharma. Um, so I, I did what hopefully all of you will decide to do. I, I reached out within my network. Um, and fortunately, UCSF also provided me with that as well. I had classmates that had transitioned to pharma. Um, and I spoke with one of them who explained to me what medical affairs within a pharma company does. And so medical affairs is the branch of the company that helps communicate the science and the clinical data supporting the safe and efficacious use of, of products um, you know, in, in, in the clinic. Um, and she explained to me that she had had a role as a medical science liaison, which is terms I'd never heard of before. But it turns out this is a position that works in the field and helps interact with key opinion leaders and physicians to, to directly address their questions as they arise and actually travels to the country and, and speaks directly to, to groups of physicians to explain the the data that the companies uh, accumulated and to answer the questions that are far deeper in scope than what sales and marketing are, are able to do. And, and I was intrigued. And so I began to talk to the hiring manager. And so two or three weeks after I made my first uh, contact with uh, the company I'm at now, uh, I became uh, I became part of the staff. Um, you know, I had really fantastic um, you know, mentor, Matthias Hebrock at, at, at UCSF, had a fantastic mentor um, at Harvard. Um, they both cautioned me about making sure this is what I wanted to do because I think there's a perception that it's hard to come back once you make a, a certain decision in your career, which for me was particularly ironic since the director of the lab at Harvard I worked at, uh, Lee Rubin, had actually come from a very successful career in industry back into academia because of the tools he had learned in industry. So the very person who was cautioning me about the, the step I was taking had actually successfully made the reverse transition. Um, and I haven't looked back once. So I've been at Faring Pharmaceuticals for 11 years. Upon joining, being in medical affairs gave me really deep um, therapeutic area training and how clinicians all across the country um, you know, practice medicine in the spaces that were relevant to Faring's core business. I don't think even at medical school you get a chance to talk to hundreds of different physicians and understand the differences in the spectrum of, of how the same types of disease states are managed by their colleagues in different parts of the country and, and, and the world for that matter. So, so I think it gave me a unique perspective. I was also upfront with telling my, my managers um, at Faring who were also supportive that my ultimate goal would be to transition into a career within Faring's research and development department that I would love to get involved in clinical research. And they were supportive of that. And about, you know, after my second year of fairing, um, they invited me to propose um, a trial, um, which is called a, a phase four trial, not for a, a approval of a new drug, not for expansion of a label, but to provide novel insights into how the use of one of fairing's pharma, you know, products might be improved. 
they invited me to, to, to propose a, a design of a trial that would be important to the business, important to showing novel, novel uses of our drugs. And, and I did that and the company funded it. And so the trial was on the verge of being launched right when a position in R&D opened up. And so for them, it was a fairly simple decision, fortunately, to take me from medical affairs and put me in a role in, in clinical research. And, and so it was a great way to kind of end up where I'd, I'd aspired to be. And so for the past seven years, I've assumed um, increasing levels of responsibility within clinical research. And, and today I lead the, uh, the US um, clinical development program across fairings, um, four major therapeutic areas, um, which, is, which is a very exciting place to be. Um, so, so like all things, I think there's, there's a little bit of serendipity, a little bit of luck, and then you know, effort that goes into to getting you where, you where you hope to be. Thank you, Patrick, and thank you again, Brandy. Um, Patrick mentioned a title, Medical Science Liaison. So if you're interested in, if this is the first time you've heard that, um, our, I think May is the month that we cover careers like um, medical science liaison, but also similar field-based careers like field application scientists. So stay tuned for um, some of those applied scientist roles that are out in the field come next year. And with that, I'll hand it over to Jasmine. Yes, thank you, Mike. I, I certainly learned a lot, so thank you all. There are a lot of rich experiences there. Um, yeah, so I would like to uh, give this question to Brandy. Uh, so Brandy, can you speak about Navic Spaces holding the identity you hold? Uh, what major challenges did you or do you face? And what can those entering this space expect? Um, the first part of you, you kind of broke up a little bit at the beginning. Can you just repeat the? Yeah, sorry. Um, and let me know if I break up, if I lose connection, uh, that again. Can you speak about navigating company client field spaces, holding the identity you hold? Sure. And, yeah, mm -hmm. you can go ahead with that one. Sure. Um, I, I think um, obviously what's been going on within um, this country in particular, um, it, it would be um, an unfortunate thing to not talk about um, my personal experience as a woman of color, an African-American, um, and a woman um, in this space of biotechnology, right? Um, and so I think uh, for me, one of the things that, you know, I have to say part of it is, um, as, far, as far as navigating the space is, is just I'm inherently, um, I would say, an adventurer. Um, I'm somebody who, if I see something I want to go for it, I go. Um, in some cases, I've had mentors. In some cases, I have not. Um, but I'm really big about stepping into a space, taking up space. And, and part of that is also being willing to um, take a seat at a table that you may be the only one, whether you're only male, only female, the only person of, the, of your race um, or, or your you know, sexual background, but I think it's really having the courage to step into a space and not, um, and, and, and hold some confidence with that. Because I think sometimes, you know, you, you, you sometimes do a lot of ne negative self-talk, right? And I get for, for people of color, sometimes it's not about just self-talk. It's your real experiences out in the real world that might shape how you show up and, and, and also impact your confidence and your courage. Um, and so I think, you know, for me, it was really always about arming myself educationally and making sure that um, I'm prepared when I walk in a space, I am knowledgeable, and if I'm not, that I can admit if I don't know something, um, and really also leaning on allies, right? So I think before that was a thing, right? And I say it, was a, it became a thing in the last two years where everybody's talking about it, but I've always really leaned on people that don't look like me, um, people not from the same background as me to really um, so to, to get some support and to help me navigate. And, and when I think about UCSF, you know, I had, um, I think, I don't know if she's still there, Catherine um, Waters uh, was the one African-American professor within the School of Nursing. And, you know, naturally I was just, I was excited when I walked in to see her, but I was also excited to see some of the other uh, professors and then kind of like, hooked myself on to those who knew that I had an interest to not follow, how, to go off the beaten path, because sometimes you get discouraged too, because, you know, it's like, well, nobody does that. Nurses don't go work in the pharma industry. And if they do, you have to know somebody. And so I think, again, having these professors say, you know what, we support you and we can provide you uh, folks within our networks. And so 
again, when I think about it, allies, it's also taking advantage of folks that they know and then having them sponsor you um, and mentor. So, I mean, I think it's been for me again, um, so far a very positive experience. I've definitely had um, uh, a few not so good experiences um, working within the pharmaceutical industry, but overall, um, it's been pretty good, but you know, again, I, I just, uh, again, I've, I'm, I'm somebody who walks in and I'm going to just pull my seat up and, and Hey, introduce myself and find a space for myself. And, um, and then, you know, you just have to deal with, um, what you deal with as it comes, because you just don't know until you walk into space, how things are going to play out. And, and so again, I don't go in anticipating those things either. Um, I think, you know, it's just not who I am, but I don't know if that helps answer that question, but yeah, thank you, Brandy. I definitely resonated with a lot of what you said, being that I also hold uh, a lot of intersectional identities. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm not sure if you uh, could speak on the second question. If you, if you don't have a, a specific answer, uh, I can definitely pass it on to Mike so we can go on to the following question. But do you have any uh, specific examples of challenges that you faced um, while entering this space or these uh, various spaces and sure. that you didn't expect? Um, I definitely say one of one experience that that stands out for me just, you know, as a woman um, was, you know, being on a team that was, I think there were maybe 10 males and maybe two, two females. And it was a group they were building um, at Amgen, um, the compliance organization. And I was super excited. I kind of got plucked from a role in regulatory and I came in. And so it was very interesting because I would sit in this uh, room with my teammates and my boss. And I really, you know, genuinely um, loved working with him. But I did find that very often there would be conversations we're talking and strategizing about what we're doing as a team. <laughs> you know, I'd say something and it would just kind of blow over. And then someone in the room would say the, almost the identical thing. And it's like, hey, hey, that's a really good idea. And so you kind of, you know, would be like, I just said that. <laughs> right? And so I definitely was like, I know that it didn't come from a, a, a bad a, a place of intent, a bad intention or malintention but it happens and it, it does impact you. And so, you know, some of those things actually can impact how you show up and your behavior in other settings, right? Because you're feeling like I'm not heard. Um, so what do I need to do to make sure I'm heard? And so that was, that was an interesting one because I, I was just like, well, I, you know, I really like all these guys, but there were literally two women and like 10 guys. And then they would go do lunches together because they kind of had an issue with, and back then, that's, that's when a lot of um, inf infinity groups started. So there was always, um, there was, you know, the Asian, um, Amgen Asian group, the Black Employee Network, there was all of these groups, LGBTQ, but there, there really wasn't one for white males. And so I think they start to create their own little group, they would go to lunch. And so, you know, it was, I get, they, they maybe they had a concern with, with the way that the company was kind of supporting other folks, but that was always interesting, but I just really tried to push that off. But really, mostly what I did was just talk to my boss and just tried to make sure he understood kind of that I added value. Um, and I was really concerned about, about um, you know, again, you always want to impress your boss and you want to, you know, um, please your, your leadership. And so I think for me, that was one that stands out was just, just being a female and, and um, one of too, um, and just feeling like, okay, I'm not sure I'm being heard, you know, and, and how can I add value if I'm not being heard? Yeah, that's definitely one that would stick out to me also, two out of 12. <laughs> yeah, so kudos to you for being able to navigate that and still find a way to show up every day. So uh, thank you for that example, and I'll pass it on to Mike. Yes, thank you indeed, Brandy. So this next question is for both of you, and that's thinking about how you got to where you are now and asking what has been the most pivotal in getting to you to your, uh, excuse me, what has been most pivotal in getting you to the position you have currently? And we'll give this to Patrick first. So I think the uh, the most pivotal trait that gets got me to where I'm at now is the same one that got me through graduate school and my postdoc. I think that's really important to maintain a healthy sense of optimism. Um, even when things look pretty bleak. And the same thing is true for a failed experiment as it is for a failed clinical trial or disappointing feedback from the FDA. And oftentimes you can take those things and, and turn them to, into a positive. And, and there's 
you know, I think the, you know, a, a, a power to that. Um, and listening to some of the uh, eulogies for, for Colin Powell, I was uh, struck by somebody who mentioned that one of his guiding principles in life was that optimism is a force multiplier. And, and I think there's a lot to be said for that, um, especially dealing with the complexities, not only of bench research, but also the complexities uh, of bringing a drug to market. Um, given the, the shocking number of all the things that have to go right for anything to, to, to hit the, the US market, um, it's amazing that any drugs are approved, to be quite frank. So I think having optimism in terms of the approach is, is, is really important. And um, I think that's, that's, that's pivotal. I, I've talked to the fact that taking advantage of synergies um, is, is really important, but then also being eager to, uh, to take on new responsibilities and to volunteer for projects and to, to really cultivate the, the collaborative relationships you have. Um, Again, that's no different than what all of the you know the people here at UCSF are doing currently in their in their academic pursuits. Um, you really, it, it's almost impossible to do things on your own. You, you rely upon having a really strong team, a really strong support network to to move things forward. Um, so I think those are the things that, that have allowed me to to be successful um, in my career. Thank you for that, Brandy. I think, um, again, speaking to just my fearless spirit, <laughs> I, um, I definitely consider myself a go-getter. I um, am very ambitious and driven and um, curious, right? I think having a healthy sense of curiosity, um, even when something's good, you can have a really good role that you're in and you're like, yeah, but what else is out there for me, right? So for me, um, I'm going through that now and I just started a role uh, four months ago, right? So um, I would say again, just, uh, and also, you know, uh, going back to what Patrick said, having um, and taking the initiative. Um, and I think a lot of those things have led me to where I am, but I would say one really important thing that has done me so, so much good is just this concept of like building and maintaining relationship capital. And so it is really critical that you build relationships and meet people, talk to people. I think it's increasingly difficult now with everybody working from Zoom, you know, from home or popping into offices now where you might not be there and or something happens the day you're not there. So so you have to do put a little more effort into it. But it is really and for some people it can it can put them in a in a place where they feel out outside of their comfort zone. Um, but you know, you can't really fulfill your calling in your comfort zone. That's that's what I like to say. And so, um, you know, I'm very purpose driven as well. So I, I'd say those are some of the things that um, have helped me to get here. Thank you both. Me and OCPD were just talking about that yesterday about how like the effort to connect with those with whom you work or in your network is takes a little bit more now. And we're trying to Think about how do we integrate that into this new way of working. So mm -hmm. thank you for that. I'm glad yeah. we're not the one, only ones thinking about this too. <laughs> um, Jasmine, please, I'll hand it to you. Yes, definitely. So I will pass this question to Patrick again. Uh, so as a grad student or a postdoctoral scholar, what were your values? Uh, what were your value? Uh, what values were met in your first role following your grad school or postdoc experience, and which were not? Uh, and what are your values now? And I'll pass it on to Brandy. Oh, I think you lost connection. I'm sorry. Was that question for? for there we go. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Sorry, Patrick. Yes. Uh, this Patrick is for you. Uh, if you need me to repeat it, I can. No, no, I, I think I heard it. So uh, you, you asked about what my values are um, now versus what they might have been as a graduate student and postdoc. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so um, they haven't changed. Um, I think that one of my biggest professional fears is being bored. And so I don't, don't wanna do things that are boring. I wanna to continue to grow, I wanna learn new things, I wanna develop new skills. Um, I, I, I want something where each day is a new adventure. And um, you know, to date, I haven't been disappointed in that. Um, I, I, it also took me a while to understand too that it's the, it's the struggles um, in school, it's the struggles uh, professionally that actually give all this work meaning. Um, you know, the, the, the most joy I have is actually coming up with solutions to novel problems. 
and understanding that actually is is it lifts a big weight off of you that um, these things that you see that you know could be seen as being quite uh, quite negative are actually opportunities to to be creative and innovative to uh, to find new solutions and that's that's really where the, I get the most joy now and where I got the most joy um, as a graduate student once once I realized it um, and then I, I want to do things that that are meaningful. Um, I began my my initial career back um, when I started undergraduate, um, focused on marine biology. I, I grew up in Ohio. I, I'm not sure why I was fascinated by the ocean. I had only seen it once when I was three um, until I, I began a, a program in, in marine biology. But I'd, I I loved sitting with my grandfather watching old old episodes of Jacques Cousteau and Sea Hunt. And so I started off in marine biology and I loved it. Um, but at the time, what was missing was a little bit of the uh, sense of urgency. And I heard a talk by, uh, by a cancer researcher talking about his research. And it was immediately apparent to me how vitally important those, those uh, research questions were. And, and, and I wanna be doing things that, that have, have greater meaning. And, and for me, being part of, of medical research as a graduate student, as a postdoc, um, and now in my professional life, um, that's very satisfying, knowing that what we do might actually benefit, you know, thousands, if not millions of people um, is gratifying. Perfect. Thank you, Patrick. And I'll pass it on to you, Brandy. Um, if you need me to answer, uh, restate the question, I can. Oh, no, I think I got it. Um, so I would say for me, um, well, for one, Patrick, we have to chat after I'm from Ohio as well so I'm like super excited over here like woohoo um but uh yeah I think one that again started with and is still here today for me is just excellence right you know truly that word um means a lot from just an early age all the way through now and I think um that theme again and that value is is so important um I think the other thing is is just when I think about career wise, so that was definitely for school. I think hard work, you know, just knowing like you know, we've always been told hard work pays off, and and I do think that there there's still a lot of truth to that. Um, I realized um, that I realized the first job, right? What was what I realized wanted to be was was a I would say a big focus of mine is coming from a clinical background, having a strong clinical foundation and being a nurse, working bedside, um, having these relationships I built with patients, you know, in the room, building relationships with their families. That while I wanted to transition into the pharmaceutical uh, industry or biotechnology industry, it was super important that I really work for companies that their mission statements were very clear and that patients were truly the focus. The patient is the North Star of everything that you're doing. Um, and not profit. And there are companies that even now profit is still, it is, it is high on the list. I mean, of course, everybody wants to see these, you know, companies prosper. I, I'm, you know, obviously as, as a stakeholder and have worked in the industry, it's important, but, but I mean, I think when you think about, again, the human, just the human connections that I've had with patients and to go somewhere and really make sure that the companies I'm working for are patient focused, but also that, um, and, and I've, I've had such good, interesting discussions with HR uh, departments at companies when I've interviewed about the C-suite and what diversity they had um, up in the leadership, uh, you know, the office of the CEO. And so I've actually turned down opportunities where I saw no women or I saw, um, you know, just uh uh, a, a white men, you know, so I think because I think it sets a tone for the organization. And so I think those are those are important things to make, you know, um, culture also of an organization, I would say is, is an important value. So those are those would be some of the things I would think. Um, I don't know when you say that I've not met. I don't know that I have any there I would that jump out at me, but No, yeah, that's great. Thank you so much, Randy. Um, and I'll pass it on to Mike. Yes, thank you, both of you. I say this often, but I, I always stress the importance of someone's values in their career decisions, because regardless of doing something you enjoy doing and that you're good at, if it doesn't meet your values, then you're going to not enjoy your work and look mm -hmm. for new opportunities. So, mm -hmm. um, so thank you both for, you know, telling your stories in that regard, and hopefully we'll connect with others. So, with that, though. 
Um, speaking of the triumvirate of skills and interests and values, we're gonna pivot to skills and thinking about like the skills that your training provided you while you're at UCSF that you currently use regularly um, and what those might be and versus what skills did you need to learn that wasn't part of your training that you had to learn on the job or um, seek out resources to learn in another way. And I will start with Patrick because that seems to be like how we're bouncing back and forth to give everybody, a, to give somebody a break and you Randy from speaking. So, so we'll start with Patrick. Uh, thanks. Um, the, the critical thinking, the experimental design, the data analysis, um, these are all skills I honed to the bench um, during my time at, at UCSF. Um, they certainly have served me well. Um, it, it gives me the ability to understand and speak credibly to the enormous amount of translational research um, that, that leads therapeutics into the clinic. And, that, and that's really important when interacting with internal stakeholders, where you're looking for support of the project, as well as when you're engaging with regulators, those the FDA, you're trying to convince of the merits of your proposed trial design, and then explaining how you arrive at those trial designs to the investigators. I mean, those, those, those skills are all um, really important. And, and I just want to mention too, that where I'm at currently in the company is not typically a role that um, is, is open to, to PhDs. Usually it's a, an MD uh, that's required for, for a path through clinical development. Um, and, that, and that component of the job is, that, that relates to that is the monitoring of the safety and subjects in clinical trials. And that's why companies tend to focus on MDs, the role. Um, it's also why um, I think for me, the path forward into the company was, was lateral in terms of showing my competency <clears throat> and my capability to, to allow me to rise. Um, but what's very true is that no um, member of the clinical department uh, makes decisions about safety in a vacuum that there's full participation by other internal physicians um, who have the medical training to, to make uh, review rigorous um, and satisfying liability concerns. And there's, there's external physicians that sit on those committees as well. Um, and, and here again, like having the really strong biomedical science foundation that uh, UCSF provided has, has served me really well in holding my own in those conversations. Um, in terms of um, the things that I needed to develop, um, you know, Regulatory affairs was a mystery to me at first. Um, you know, I, I, I needed to understand all the different lights of the dashboard and that to be turned green before, before a drug could come to market. Um, the rules, the regulations, the site interactions, um, industry guidelines. And here being medical affairs is my first stop in, in pharma was, a, was an asset because medical affairs interacts with all these core functions within the company. Um, I even got to sit on um, the review of promotional sales marketing materials that Brandy referenced, although my job was to provide medical um, oversight rather than regulatory. Um, and as Brandy mentioned, those, those things are quite fun. Um, and then the, probably the most important thing for me um, when I was first getting started and continues to be an area where I, I want to grow is uh, developing a really detailed understanding of statistics. Um, so knowing your stats, speaking the same language um, as a biometrics team, that is a superpower. Um, one I coveted, one I still you know, continue to try to, to grow. So being able to argue the relative merits of a, a frequentist versus a Bayesian uh, adaptive design um, ends up being super important um, you know, in terms of uh, your ability to talk to, to FDA, your ability to talk credibly uh, to, to investigators and, and publish really good papers. Um, so those are the things that I, that I continue to, to, to work on. And then yeah, as, as my responsibilities have grown, um, you know, I'm focused on you know, developing my management skills. So it's, it's a really, it was a shock for me moving from a role as an individual contributor where I've been my entire career into trying to manage a team of individual contributors and to, and to give them the space and the, and, the, and the guidance, the support they needed to, to, to survive and thrive, um, just, just as all the strong mentors I had had throughout my career gave me. Um, so th those are things that I'm, I'm currently focused on and, and continue to work on um, in my day to day. Thank you, and Brandy. Yes, um, I would say for myself, you know, coming from NIH, and I just, you know, right out of undergrad, went straight into working in a clinical research environment at the bedside. 
I had no formal training, you know, it's, it, it was kind of like take care of these patients, they're on studies, we understood protocols to an extent, but um, coming to UCSF and focusing on clinical research allowed me to really learn and understand clinical research, you know, from soup to nuts. And, and with that um, was how and is how I'm able to, um, I would say, be successful in the role that I've had in regulatory affairs, particularly with the advertising and promotion arm that I've, I've I specialize in um, because you need to understand data. In order to understand the data, you need to understand the study design. You need to understand how many patients, and so all of that, um, which I you know, didn't get into in super detail. But you know, my role in regulatory is to basically work with sales and marketing. I would say those are my clients, and help them figure out how to promote the product compliantly and to ensure that um, we're following the regulations that FDA has set forth on prescription drug promotion. And so if you're um, sitting in a room with marketing and they say, hey, we wanna make a claim that 90% of patients who are on this, uh, take this product um, saw, uh, or 90% of patients saw clearance in their psoriasis plaques or something like that. These claims, you know, that's what marketing does. They wanna make claims of, about the products. Um, you need to understand the data. So how do we get to 90%? Are, are we talking about, you know, how many patients were in the study? How many trials do we have? Is this, a, is this an open label study? Is this a uh, randomized controlled trial? Um, so there are things that the program definitely allowed me to have as a nice foundation to transition into regulatory affairs where, you know, I, again, similar Patrick, I didn't understand what they did. I thought it was boring. I'm like, what do you guys do over here? And then, you know, I got, again, relation, the relationship building part, I can't stress enough, talking to some folks, going to lunch with people outside of my department, learned about this group right in my, you know, um, building called Regulatory Affairs. And they said, oh yeah, there's a group that is called advertising and promotion. And I'm like, well, how do they, how do they make their way into regulatory? <laughs> and so they said, well, you know, their area is, you know, this area is very much, it's, it's a niche and it is an area that um, they're looking for, not just, you know, going back to training, I had this very nice foundation from UCSF, but also what are your people skills like? You know, you're gonna have to sit in a room with folks who are very passionate about um, their, their marketing materials. They've spent sometimes millions of dollars to create. And you need to really be able to um, if you work the room, if you will, and understand who you're who you're in the room with and build relationships with them with them. And so I would say school basic, you know, knowledge that I needed to understand the data that we need to know in order to be able to promote the pro products, but also um, what I had to learn. Um, it says, what did I need to learn? I had to learn about how to really become like this collaborative strategist because you're working in these collaborative, a lot of pharma companies, you work in teams. I mean, that's how you get things done. Um, and so really being strategic about how you collaborate, um, being, I would say, a persuasive uh, communicator. You know, you're going to have to sometimes influence those marketers to come away from what they feel so passionate about, you know, and, and so I would say learning and having influence and, and not just having influence across, but above and below you. And then I would say, um, uh, I would say strong interpersonal skills. I've kind of said that and then diplomacy skills. Those are some of the things that, you know, I didn't necessarily at the bedside need to have these things, right? And then to come to grad school and then go into from grad school to the pharmaceutical industry, I had to, you know, learn that. So again, good mentors, um, some good bosses, and then some just, you know, learn by doing. <laughs> Thank you for that, for sure. Um, just the knowledge that, you know, the skills that you get at, in a, in a training setting are applicable outside and that you don't have to know at all you can get it on the job is important too <laughs> um and i and this is gonna this is a a follow-up question and the, um just based on what brandy and then you know patrick you can chime in on this too because you had mentioned there's like different pillars of regulatory affairs and i learned something new through that too because so could you share randy what those are just for those who might be interested in regulatory affairs like what are the different subsectors that they could go into that might might one might meet somebody's interest more than another sure so i i think um well obviously the one that i focused on is is uh advertising and promotion so again you have this this um, umbrella of regulatory affairs and then underneath and again to, to kind of briefly explain this is that function within the company that i always say um, every company has to have a regulatory department because you are the liaison to the health authority whether that is health authority in 
the UK, if it's um, uh, the health authority here in the US, if it's uh, on visa, which is health authority in Brazil, you have a regulatory affairs department. So just a plug for regulatory affairs, there are, there are plenty of jobs and you're needed <laughs> because they can't run the company without regulatory. Um, and so uh, regulatory advertising promotion is gonna work with you know, marketing and sales because you're trying to help to compliantly promote your products. And you're gonna work with medical, uh, Patrick's, you'll work with legal, you'll work with compliance um, and market access, you know, the folks who help get your drug on formulary. And then you have um, submissions, you know, that's a function that people don't always realize, but somebody's got to get this stuff to the FDA and the FDA has a now electronic only submission process. So somebody's got to know that and, and do that well. There's regulatory labeling um, where they're building the label. So the package insert or the, you know, we say prescribing information often with physicians. Someone's got to draft that and that's what you, that's your label. That's what says, here's what the indication is. Here's the adverse event data. Here are warnings and precautions. Um, Etc. So that's labeling. And then you've got strategy role, which is a really cool role, I would say. Um, and strategy um, is really about, again, how do you get this product to market as well? It's a, it's a different function than my role, I would say, but it's a super important role. And you're looking globally oftentimes more so than not these days, um, you know, to strategize with your uh, other uh, regulatory contacts in other parts of the world, and also your marketing teams to really understand, okay, here's what we want to, this is the product, this is what we identified as the area that we're going to go for, or we want to develop product here, develop a product. So this development process, I think you really would see, and Patrick, I'm probably over, overly simplifying this, but um, really that development of that product, taking it from clinical trials to commercialization, there's a strategy role, right, that sits really nicely within there. And then I think I mentioned writing, regulatory writing. Someone's got to write um, uh, the dossiers that you have to have available for FDA. Um, so there are, those are the, the ones that jump out at me. Um, and again, a good way to get exposure is just if you have an opportunity to reach out to people, you, you know, I'm a big proponent of cold calling, basically reach out to people on LinkedIn and ask them, hey, do you have a minute? Can I talk to you? I want to understand more about what you do. Um, that's a great way to do it or take internships within that will allow you to rotate within those departments. Um, so yeah, that's a very simplified <laughs> um, description. Patrick, that was fantastic. To, uh, weigh in uh, if you think there's something I missed. No, I think you've done a fantastic job of giving an overview. Um, the other thing I would just describe is just the, 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 the order in which those things occur. So, cause that's, that's how things are organized in my head. Um, so they begin with the strategy. So you, you, you work towards developing a clinical development plan that is acceptable to the FDA. And that usually takes multiple meetings um, and lots of uh, consternation on the, on the part of the sponsor as well as the agency before you can agree on a plan that can meet the FDA's needs in terms of what they've given as guidance to other sponsors and in terms of whatever burden of proof they expect to see to allow this product to be approved while also aligning close enough to the standard of care that you can recruit the trial and conduct the trial without torturing your patients and your investigators in terms of you know, feasibility and cost. And then also satisfy the later needs that will come up in the labeling discussions and marketing discussions as to what data is meaningful to establish how your product fits into current treatment paradigms. And as Brandy said, this is a really exciting part of the whole process because it requires you know, getting all these very different things to line up. And then you conduct the trials and you put together the submission package, which includes data from the trials, includes data from manufacturing and stability and quality control. And, and these, these submissions are enormous. And so having the right people to organize those and maintain really good close attention to detail, that's important. And in those two first two pillars, um, you know, writing is a really strong component of that. So there are people that are, that are just focused on the documentation, making sure that we have everything organized in a way that meets FDA needs. And there's other people that have focused on regulatory writing to make sure you advance it forward. And if those things work, then you get to the fun part of labeling, where you sit down around a table and put together a proposal to the FDA as to what your label should look like. And for those that um, may not be aware, the label is the gospel. That is what the company is allowed to compliantly promote in terms of how we talk to our physicians and our patients. 
and there's you know those TV ads you see with all those you know safety disclaimers in there. Those all come straight from the label. So getting those right and, and having a productive discussion with the FDA about what the label says, those are critically important because then that you know influences the piece that, that Brandy takes care of in terms of you know making sure that whatever claims we you know, are made from the sales and marketing people can be immediately linked to uh, to, to the label for the drug. So it, it's it's a it's a really dynamic um, part of the company for sure, and one that's critically important. Thank you both for that. Un, unpredictable, not unpredictable, unprepared question that I threw at you. So I appreciate it. Um, on that, if people are interested, because it's, you know, like Patrick said, where does this all fit in and the order of operations for a product development? There's a great book, and I'll drop the link in a moment. It's called Career Opportunities in Biotechnology and Drug Development. And it will allows you to see like what are all the careers along a product development pipeline. And because there are those pre-development or pre-market and those post-market as well. So it's a great resource if you're curious what where you might fit in in a in, in industry broadly. So, and with that, I will pass it our last question off before we open to Q&A to Jasmine. Yeah, thank you, Mike. And again, I learned so much because there's so many, so many moving pieces or moving parts that you just lose sight of. And you think that one person does all of these jobs or something like that, but it, it really takes a village, like Mike said earlier. Um, so for our last question before we enter into the Q&A. So how does your current position fit in with your overall career plan or story? Are you in the position that is best for you right now or is your current position a step on the way to your career goal? And I'll hand this over to Brandy since you kind of just made a career switch. So I think that you can uh, start us off here. <laughs> um, I Yes, I'm definitely the person that you come to for support if you're struggling with the concept of moving around because I have no fear. Um, I think it's about having, again, I said being courageous and having confidence and also, you know, people forget, but you know, you working for a company at any moment, they can let you go, but you always want to be able to be ready to step out and you take your career where you want it to go. Um, and not feel like you owe this company something. You know, when you're working for companies that are 40,000 employees, they may treat everyone well, but at the end of the day, you have to decide what is important to you in your career and how are you going to best get there. And so that being said, um, as somebody who's been doing at promo, I say, or working in advertising promotion under regulatory affairs for the last 17 years, um, I have had a couple of stints within the ethics and compliance space. So there's an ethics and compliance component of the pharmaceutical company that is super critical and actually a lot of fun as well. You actually spend a lot more time looking at what the company is doing from like basically A to Z, like all things that the company is doing. There's a compliance probably uh, uh, function that is trying to make sure the company is not going to get into trouble and have the Department of Justice come in and slap them with fines and other other uh, things that are not fun to have. Um, so um, I am really trying to right now just enjoy the consulting life. Um, it's been interesting. I'm enjoying it. I will say though, because of the way that again, my brain works and I'm already looking ahead um, and I'm really eager to, while I'm consulting, and this is part of the reason why I did this, was to step out of pharma from a you know um, traditional pharma role into a consulting role because I wanted a little more time on my plate so that I could explore the cannabis industry. I think there's going to be a huge need for regulatory professionals, as you guys probably know. Um, there already is some somewhat of a need, but particularly with the federal government, should they legislate or provide some legislation, um, there's going to be a huge need for folks with regulatory backgrounds. And so I'm looking at that um, in the future, um, as well as tech. And I think you are probably like, tech what? Well, you know, I saw and have had a couple people reach out about, you know, Facebook is looking for an FDA compliance lead. You know, TikTok needs somebody to help them with some regulatory stuff. So you know, I'm always thinking about how I can take my skills and my background and how do I take that over and again, have impact somewhere else. So I am looking at those two industries. And so I would say, again, uh, fear not and, uh, and don't also allow people because they will and all of my friends and, and even family, they're always like, 
weren't you there for, you know, or they're, they're trying to figure out why you're leaving this good job. You know, it's like, well, I can get another one, you know, <laughs> there's more than one good job out there. So I'm just of the place that I say, you know, pursue your dreams. Life is, is uh, unpredictable and it is limited. And so it is really important that you follow your dreams. And if you need to change course and you change your mind, that's okay. So that's kind of my, <laughs> my advice there. Thank you. So what I'm working on. Yeah, definitely. You have a lot in store. So I'm looking forward to see where you end up next. Next panel. Next panel. <laughs> exactly. Next panel. We'll have you uh, for another uh, sector or another month. Uh, Patrick, we'll pass it on to you to uh, close us off with this question. Sure. So um, I, I'm, I'm where I want to be. Um, I'm developing drugs. Um, I want to bring drugs to market. And um, you know, last year during the middle of the pandemic when things were pretty bleak, we actually got our first um, FDA approval for a drug that I've been working on for, for seven years, um, which is really, really exciting. Um, you know, I, I want more of those. I want, I want that feeling of, uh, of elation. I want the, the next high. Um, I want to know that the things we're doing actually will reach patients. Where I do that, to Brandy's point, um, you know, it's it's where the next challenges lie, or where the next you know interesting um, you know, problem to be solved therapeutically you know, exists, and, and I'm certainly open to to wherever that path leads. But but for right now, I'm I'm happy at the company I'm at. The projects I'm interested in, you know, that I'm working on are very very engaging and interesting, and I, and I know that what we're doing will ultimately matter. Um, so you know, I. It's a long and circuitous journey, but uh, but I'm but I'm but I'm where I want to be, um, and, and this is the path I think that I kind of decided on when I pivoted way back as an undergraduate from uh, from marine biology research towards towards medical research. Perfect, thank you, Patrick, and that's really exciting. Congrats on uh, getting that drug accepted. So, was it accepted for clinical trials, or it's it's accepted for approval through the FDA, and you're about to get it on the market? Sorry, so it's, been, it's been approved by the FDA. It's the first new treatment for infertility approved in the U.S. in 20 years, um, which gives you an indication as to how hard it is to find uh, a feasible path and, and bring it to fruition. Yeah, in seven years, that's really short, because if I'm not mistaken, it's about 10 to 20 years, usually on average, right? You are correct. I've only been engaged in the project for seven years. Um, so so that's, that's where I pick up the plot. So I, I've spent seven years thinking about it, but there are certainly people that have been involved far longer. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you both. Yes, indeed. Thank you both. As someone who's also moved around quite a lot for my career, I definitely identified with what you said, Brandy. So, um, well, with that, we'll end the recording and we'll end the um, moderated Q&A. If you're watching this recording, thank you for doing so.